Cincinnati Reds have done the absolute improbable by defeating the club considered to be the best in Major League Baseball, and they've done it in a four-game series sweep. Wire to Wire, the story of the 1990 Cincinnati Reds. The Reds went to spring training convinced they could contend in the National League West, but they also knew there was no substitute for hard work. Now if the second baseman has a pickoff play on, he's going to come up, let's say the guy comes up set home, he's going to come back, you see the back of his head, you go. Ready! Oh. That's it, Chris, right, good. good job. All right, very good. 1990 was to be a whole new ball game for the Cincinnati Reds, and that new look began with the hiring of Lou Pinella, a lifelong American leaguer. It was extremely important to get the right person in here, and uh, of course everybody kept saying, well, he's in the American League. I think, now let me think. The American League has first base, second base, third base, a home base. We have, what, four balls and three strikes? Uh, this is really different. 21 years in the American League, I get a chance to come to a new league. Uh, I get a chance to uh, go to different cities, different ballparks, uh, see different players, manage against uh, some of the uh, best known names in the managing uh, uh, profession. It, it's a tremendous opportunity and a challenge for me, and uh, if I didn't feel like I could handle it, I wouldn't be here. The Reds made other key moves, acquiring Hal Morris and Billy Hatcher to pump up the offense, and they swapped John Franco for nasty boy Randy Myers. I look at it like this, if we score eight runs a game, we're going to win a lot of ball games, and if we start out and win our first 30, 35 games in a row, we're going to be in first place. <laughs> I agree. Full of optimism, the Reds went to Houston for opening day. Only the second time this century they open the season on the road. Pre-game rituals completed, it was time to play ball. Come on, Chris. Let's start, big fella. Right away, the Reds looked different from the fifth place team they were last season. And in the 11th inning, Barry Larkin showed why. And a base hit will bring them right back down even. There it is. Nice shot right center field. That will go to the wall. There goes Sable. He'll go around third. He'll be the third run of the inning to score. And the Reds lead at 7-4. to four. They added one more. And then Randy Myers came on for his Reds debut. Will it be win number one on this slider down our way? Yes, yes it, it will. Myers strikes out. Franklin Stubbs and the Cincinnati Reds have given Lou Pinelli his first National League win. It was an exciting day for me. Uh, first managing assignment with the Reds, uh, opening day uh, in Houston, packed house, and we won in 11 innings. Barry Larkin got a, a big triple for us, uh, and it got us swinging. The Reds were off and running. They whipped the Astros and marched on through Atlanta in a blaze of April glory, bashing 10 hits in each of their first six games. They were the hottest team in baseball, and they were just getting warmed up. Strike three, got him looking. Oh, take a walk, and there it is. Reds win. Swing and a miss. Caminiti is out in another strong inning for Jack Armstrong. Sabo's third homer of the year, and of the series, he now has six RBI. The Reds won their first six games, all on the road, and then came home to Riverfront for the home opener against the Padres, and they didn't disappoint. Randy Myers came on to protect a 2-1 lead, and thanks to the defense behind him, the Reds ran their record to a perfect 7-0. They won again the next night to make it eight straight. I'm a big believer in enthusiasm and attitude, and 
um, stars, just stars don't get the job done. I think it's a team pulling together, and I think I've seen my team pull together. On April 21st, the Reds were pulling for their ninth straight win. And Gross trying to dispose of Blouser and finish it off. It is in the air on the infield. It is Duncan calling for it, and this one belongs to the Reds. A new club record, nine consecutive victories to begin a baseball season. Three days later, at the Vet in Philadelphia, it looked as if Cincinnati's great start would come to a screeching halt when Eric Davis slid into third. The ball definitely beat him, and now Davis is injured on the steal of third. Eric Davis now is limping, and along with trainer Larry Starb, Davis may have to leave this ball game. Losing Davis for almost a month could have been disastrous. Were it not for young pitching stars like Jack Armstrong, who jumped off to a five-game winning streak. What more could a manager ask of the new kid who just won the job in spring training? I wanted to have an infusion of at least one young kid uh, uh, in our starting staff. And when I went to spring training, uh, uh, the, the job was open. Uh, uh, Armstrong grabbed it. Uh, I was very impressed with the way he pitched down in, 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 in Florida. And uh, early in the season, uh, he was unhittable. Throwing strikes, being aggressive, going after hitters. Strike call. Good pitch. Breaking ball, he doesn't get it. And Armstrong has his third strikeout of the night. Armstrong won eight of his first nine starts. Proof that his hard work was paying off. I put a lot into the offseason and my preseason conditioning. I wanted to come out of the box really strong. Um, initially, just to uh, become part of the team, a big part of the team. And then, uh, as that became or came to pass, to uh, to keep going out and giving a strong outing every fifth day. It was on May 3rd against the Mets that Armstrong won his fifth in a row, and the Reds left New York 14 and five. The Reds marched on to St. Louis and after four games, left the Cardinals in a daze, outscoring them by 14 runs. The way Cincinnati was playing, nothing could go wrong, not even when reliever Tim Leana suddenly lost his head. Crowd to down the line, the ball. He picked it up. Leana picked the ball up. Picked the ball up in his hat. Smooth, man, smooth. You gotta be kidding me, he's trying to hide behind Burtz's. How red is he right now? Leanna might have been red-faced, but his team was so red-hot, they polished off a four-game sweep in St. Louis for the first time in 24 years. What's more, they pushed their lead from three games to five and a half. No one got the Reds rolling faster than shortstop Barry Larkin. He collected 22 hits in the nine-game win streak, coming back strong from a throwing injury suffered last year in the skills contest prior to the All-Star game. After a long off-season of rehab and you know, going through the, the mental mind games of I might not be able to throw anymore and going through all the, the pain and the agony and going out and trying to throw and having terrible results, but it was good to be back. And back he was. Got up the middle, flat by Larkin. Got him. Oh, what a play. Oh, is he something else? This is Major League. Great play to even get to the ball. Turns and spins and throws and one hops it. Like the Davy Conception. Look at that. It's a shot. What a play by Larkin. Can he throw him out? Yes, sir. What a play. Barry is, uh, I think, the top shortstop in all of baseball. Uh, he's very consistent with the glove. He's got great range, great hands. He is really our field general in the infield. Uh, he handles those type of situations. And where do you find a shortstop that can hit uh, 300 and drive in 60, 70 runs? Even with Larkin's exploits, the Reds hit a rough spot in June and needed a lift. On June 13th, they got it. They got their bats back in the swing and took off. Paul O'Neill made hearty contributions, 
Against Houston, he chalked up his third four-hit game as Cincinnati piled up the wins, six in a row. Glenn Braggs, fresh from the Milwaukee Brewers, delivered early and often. A drive to left. Ballpark will never hold it. Reds lead, two to one. Braggs' blast was one of five Cincinnati homers in one game against Houston. In one inning alone, there were three. First, Chris Sable. A drive to left. He unties it. Puts it into the seat. One batter later, Barry Larkin connected. And there's another blast. Back to back homers. Larkin follows. And following Larkin. Eric Davis was back, and back with a vengeance. He caught fire in the midst of Cincinnati's six-game win streak and earned Player of the Week honors batting 476. And his power was back. Against the Dodgers, he collected his 150th home run. But Davis wasn't the only slugger making noise. Chris Sable, coming off five home runs in May, hit six more in June. There's a high run. Wind looks up. Go on, the home run. Sable was a big part of Cincinnati's thrilling first half, using a little bit of everything to beat the opposition. When the Reds needed a hero, Sable was it. There goes Sabo, and the pitch of strike throw through, not in time. Boy, he had a jump and a half. A 2-2 tie, the pitch by Burke. Ground ball through the hole, base hit, the Reds win. Sabo singles in the winning run. Duncan scores. The Reds win it 3-2. Great play by Sabo. Can he throw him up? Yes. Highway robbery there. Sabo, left field, way back, way back, looking up Daniels, goodbye, home run, Chris Sabo! I enjoy watching him play. Uh, he gets dirty, he's a blue-collar type guy. Uh, this year he's hit for more power than he has in other years, and he's played very consistently at third base. Gaining power with age, Sabo would wind up with a team-best 25 homers. What's more, his 38 doubles were the most of any third baseman in the league. I think I've been more consistent this year than I have been in the past. Uh, I think every year I've gotten a little bit better, and hopefully it will continue. Next year I, I uh, fully intend to do, do even better. By the end of June, the Reds had left the rest of the West in their wake, and no amount of aggressive play seemed too aggressive. Great game, great finish. O'Neill at second, Davis at first, two out, ninth inning. Dodgers six, Reds five. Curve ball, hit down the right field line. That's trouble. In comes the tying run. Here comes the winning run to out at the plate, and we're going to extra inning. Cincinnati went on to lose, but the Reds were making it clear they would do whatever they could to win. Two nights later, Norm Charlton figured he'd go all out. Two on, two out, and a base hit down the line. Benzinger will score. Charlton is going to try and score. Griffin's relay. A collision. Sosha drops the ball. I figure if I hit him harder than he hits me, then, then I'll come out of it okay. And uh, fortunately, you know, I hit him high, and, and the ball got there at the same time, and, and he couldn't control the ball, and I came across the play. You know, I don't think I'm the only guy on this team that would do that. We've got a bunch of guys that play hard and uh, are aggressive, and uh, you're going to do whatever it takes to win. By the All-Star break, the Reds were 21 games over 500 with the best record in baseball. They'd been in first place every day since the season started. On July 10th, 
the Reds sent five All-Stars to Wrigley Field, the biggest contingent of any National League team. Chris Sabo was the popular choice at third. Playing third base from the Cincinnati Reds, Chris Sabo. Jack Armstrong, on the strength of an 11-3 first half, was honored with the starting assignment and threw two shutout innings. The other Reds All-Stars included nasty boy Rob Dibble, shortstop Barry Larkin making his third straight All-Star appearance, and the other nasty boy, Randy Myers. Though the Nationals lost, five Cincinnati Reds ended the first half in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Winning was getting nasty. The Reds had three nasty characters to prove it. He got him. Dibble strikes out the side. Swing on this. He got him with the slider. Randy Myers shuts down the Pirates here in the ninth inning. 2 2 pitch to Matt Williams. Way out in front, and he struck him out. A nasty boy, a guy who really works his tail off on the field, um, has a good time, um, tries to earn the respect of his peers, and just is basically kind of a cut above the regular player. He, he wants to be fair and square, but with a little intimidation added in. Well, on the field, somebody who's got a lot of mm -hmm. to him and everything. I think it's just a matter of the way we approach the game when we're on the field. Off the field, we're all individuals. We're basically like anyone else, but when we're on the field, we have a job doing. We go about doing our job. We are intense on the field. When we step between the lines, it's 110 percent. It's adrenaline. It's coming right at you. They were called the Nasty Boys, and they were the hardest throwing bullpen in the majors. Firing 95 mile an hour bullets, the three relievers blew away National League hitters all season wound up with a combined 351 strikeouts and 44 saves. On July 23rd, the Reds went to San Diego and boosted their lead to its highest point of the season, 11 games. But where everything had gone right, suddenly it was all going wrong. One day after reaching their peak, the Reds went into a tailspin and skidded through eight straight losses, and their lead started to shrink. High fly ball, left field, five and a half back. Giants sweep the Reds. Well, when your starter and your best starter gets nailed this quickly, Cause for concern. O'Neal going back. He's at the wall. And it's out of here. And they tie it up against Randy Myers. So no save today for Randy Myers. Back, back. That ball, a grand slam home run. The Padres go ahead, 7-3. to three. The Giants have now cut the Reds' lead in the Western Division to only six and a half ball games. Going, going, it is gone into the mezzanine. The Cincinnati Reds, who started out 30 and 12 at the beginning of this year, have fallen on some hard times. What had been a dream season was blowing up in Cincinnati's face. At the end of July, their lead shrunk to five and a half games. Drastic measures had to be taken. And Ron Oster was brave enough to take one. Oster swinging at the first pitch. And if you're wondering, where's the hair under his helmet? Last night, after the eighth straight loss, Oster shaved his head. Fielder. Had the head shaved by Eric Davis. It's like a Hare Krishna from the L.A. airport. Green Abdul Oster. We lost the eighth game in, in L.A. and eighth straight, and uh, I went in and I, I was trying to get eight guys to shave their heads and nobody do it. You know, I was supposed to do that. That too, but I didn't. My wife didn't want me to. The reason I wanted to do is just try to take our mind off the game, you know, off the eight-game losing streak a little bit. Guys rallied around that. We relaxed. It showed 
uh, the guys that, hey, we can still have fun and uh, get back to where we're supposed to be. It was a lighthearted moment, and uh, we got a good kick out of it. And I'm just worried about if it's ever going to go back. If I had to do it over again, I don't know if I'd do it again <laughs> because of the, the feedback I got at home, but uh, uh, it, it turned out all right. The Reds recovered and were still in first, but their lead was down to three and a half games. On August 6th, one of the greatest players in Cincinnati Reds history was immortalized in the Hall of Fame. Joe Morgan began his career in Houston, but he belonged to the Reds. The catalyst on the big red machine that won three pennants and two world championships, Morgan was a rare talent, a speedy second baseman with great power. And no other second baseman has ever matched his back-to-back -back MVP awards. I remember after my second Most Valuable Player award, Tony Perez came in one day, I was feeling pretty good, and he said, I want you to remember this. He said, when you played for Houston, no one even knew who you were. He said, we brought you here and made you a star. <laughs> and you know what, he was right. And I say thank you to those guys every day because being a part of the Big Red Machine is also the reason that I'm here today. The Reds had built their lead back up to five and a half when the second place Giants came in for a critical four game series. The Reds took advantage of the slumping Giants and won two of the first three games. And then, prior to the fourth game, Lou Pinella caused a stir when he predicted a victory in the finale. It was a humdinger of a prediction, and in the very first inning, it was put in serious jeopardy when Matt Williams came up with two on. Davis, deep center field, and it is gone! Three-run homer for Matt Williams, scoring Clark, scoring Mitchell. And right behind him, here comes Matt, and the Giants lead four to nothing. The Reds got one run back, and then in the fourth, Joe Oliver came up with two on. On field, Mitchell going back. He's at the wall. It's off the wall. O'Neill is going to score. Duncan is going to score, and the Reds have got the lead. Randy Myers came on to save it. The victory pretty much knocked the Giants out of contention and made a profit out of Pinella. As a manager, I've got to feel confident about our ball club. Now, that's not cockiness. I just felt that our ball club would come out here today and play a good ball game and win it. Now, I'm sure that Roger felt the same way about his ball club. He just didn't say it. I did. But I'm not in the business of predicting outcomes. Believe me, that'll be the last time I do it. You learn, too. But Pinella was in the business of winning an attitude he brought to the Reds last winter. How's it feel? Feels great. Really does. Brilliant. This is a tremendous opportunity, and uh, I, I told Marge that I don't plan to disappoint her at all. But Pinella faced a big challenge. The Reds finished second four times, and last year came in fifth. They were running out of promises. Uh, this is a ball club uh, that many had picked to uh, win the division a few years back. I had a ball club that had played together for four or five years. It reminded me a lot of the 76 Yankees. It was a team that was on the verge of winning, and this was a year to get it done. The Reds couldn't get it done without Jose Rijo. He rebounded from a strained right shoulder to lead the Reds down the stretch. In the last five weeks, going six and two. Jose has been just outstanding. You know, he's been one of our big game pitchers. Um, when we need him to have a good game, then he's had it. And the way I feel right now, I feel very healthy, you know. I mean, when I feel that way, I'm going to be tough to beat. I'm not going to be unbeatable, but I'm going to be real tough to beat because I won't give nobody nothing, you know, real good to, you know, to hit. Tom Browning may have had as much confidence, but he suffered through a season of hard luck, getting little support from the Cincinnati offense and getting injured in mid-August. Still, he led the team with 15 wins. Danny Jackson showed plenty of true grit. 
despite a season of physical woes, he was a big contributor down the stretch. In the face of injuries, Cincinnati's starting pitching proved to be resilient and versatile, as nasty boy Norm Charlton demonstrated. At the beginning of the year, I was allowed to stay in the bullpen because we had such top quality starters that could do the job and were getting the job done. Then we got some guys hurt. They said, well, you know, we're, we're looking to win a pennant this year. We don't want to entrust it to a, to a younger guy, but, uh, you know, they wanted to give it to somebody who's had some experience. And, uh, and so they gave it to me. Hopefully that helped the team. He's pitched big ball games for us, and, uh, you know, he's a versatile type guy. He, he, if you put him in the bullpen, he's going to do a good job for you. If you put him in the starting rotation, he's going to do a good job for you. And he's a competitor on the mound. Behind the plate, Jeff Reed was a worthy competitor in the second half. As the Reds suddenly found themselves in the throes of a tough pennant race, Reed hit close to 300 in the last two months and filled in admirably as the number two catcher behind Joe Oliver. Getting his biggest taste of the majors yet, Oliver handled the catching chores like a pro right off the gridiron. This team had all the bases covered. The Reds acquired veteran second baseman Bill Dorn at the end of August and could now go into the pennant stretch looking all the more convincing. He's a gamer and uh, you know, he goes out there and plays hard every day, wants to win. And he brought over some experience and uh, you know he's kept guys loose on the bench and you know, he, he knows how to win and he knows what it's like to play at this level for a 162 game schedule and he's done a good job. Playing for the Reds meant that Doran was back home in Cincinnati. But he had even more reason to be motivated. When I got here, uh, the quality of the people made it nice. You know, you can, it's always nice to go to your hometown, but if you're involved with a group of guys that, that you don't particularly care for, then what's the use? But I, I happen to be involved with, with a great bunch of guys, and uh, it's, it's made it worthwhile. The Reds may have been in the thick of a pennant race, but a little time off for family day may have been just the thing to ease the pressure. For those who lost their way, the Reds provided an escort service. But now, back to the pennant race. On September 14th, Reds fans gathered at Riverfront for a showdown against the Dodgers, who had pulled within six and a half games. In the opener, Tim Liana was in a hole, facing ex-Red Cal Daniels. And he hits it hard, straight away center field. Grand slam! The Dodgers scored eight runs in the inning and crushed the Reds 10 to 4. Lou Pinello was understandably worried. In the last month, the Dodgers had moved ahead of the Giants and were coming on strong. A little good luck from Shotzi wasn't doing the trick, and the next night, neither were the Cincinnati Bats. Fastball got him looking. And the Dodger bench explodes, and the Dodgers have cut it to four and a half. Four and a half games, the closest anyone had come to the Reds since May. The Reds needed to get their offense going again, and their fans needed to get loud. Glad to oblige, Hal Morris got the Reds going in the finale. Ground ball over first and down the line. Charlton will score. Brooks up with the ball. Here comes Larkin. The relay not nearly in time on a double by Morris. Morris's double tied the score, and reliever Scott Scudder kept L.A. in check, surviving two bases-loaded jams. Fastball hit to Doran, and they're out of the inning. Boy, what a lift that gives the Reds. And what a demoralizing feeling it must give the Dodgers. The Reds' picture got even brighter in the fifth 
when Bill Doran sparked what would become a six-run rally. And there's a drive to center, and Javier started in, now has to go back, and he can't get it. Here comes Larkin, here comes Morris on the double by Doran, 4-2 Cincinnati. Three doubles for Doran, and finally, a win for the Reds. And Sammy hits a high fly ball to shallow right, a trio of Reds, and O'Neill will make the catch. Big win for Cincinnati, a bitter defeat for the Dodgers. Sporting a three-and-a-half game lead, the Reds went to San Diego and made noise. Davis, that's an RBI base hit, and the Reds take the one-to-nothing lead. Hatcher scores, going to second, there's nobody there. In the opener, the Reds scored seven runs in the first two innings, and in another clutch performance, Jose Rijo coasted to victory. And that should be the ball game, left center field. Hatcher coming in, and Rio is now 13-7, and seven, his sixth complete game of the year. They didn't get a run off him until the ninth inning. A doubleheader the next night brought out Cincinnati's clutch bats. In game one, Barry Larkin came up in the seventh with Billy Hatcher on second and the score tied at four. Larkin's single untied it and proved to be the game winner as the Reds battled back from a three-run deficit. In the nightcap, the Padres won up 2-0, but now it was the Reds' defense that caught them off guard. Eric Davis had this game covered, in the field and at the plate. Davis's two hits and three RBIs sparked Cincinnati's second straight comeback. Glenn Braggs brought home the go-ahead run in the sixth, and an inning later, the Reds added six runs for good measure. Winning the first three games, the Reds upped their lead to four and went into the finale looking for more offense from their red-hot swinger. Jerry Davis hitting at 257. Three for four on the day. He has scored three runs, single three times, twice in the infield. And make that a four for five, Dave. And bring Davis's four-game total to nine hits and six RBIs as the Reds swept San Diego and moved up to five games. The magic number brought the clinch within easy reach, but nothing was coming easy. Two days later, the Reds were shut out by the Braves, 10 to nothing. Once again, it was up to Senor Smoke. While the pennant race was plenty hot, welcome another race at Riverfront. This was the Cheetah race, and the fastest red on two legs, Billy Bates, was up against the fastest animal on four legs, the Cheetah. The race is a 100-yard dash, and we're going to give the runner about a five-second start. The Cheetah is trained to chase a lure, and he will come zooming in from center field. I get like a five second head start, I think, and then they release the cheetah. And he comes blowing right by me. After a pre-race rubdown from Randy Myers, the race was on. Seems the cheetah was no competition for Bates. As for the Reds, their race was getting down to the finish as the magic number was falling fast.
With the magic number at one, the Reds and their fans were getting that clinching feeling as they got set to play the Padres. Pinella had promised March shot a championship, and now their team was on the brink. Norm Charlton coasted along, but then gave up two runs in the sixth and one more in the seventh. And then it rained. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, the Dodgers were getting beat. The Drosian winds, the 0-2 pitch. Winds at first, the ball game is over. And so too is the season for the Dodgers, as they have been officially eliminated from the race in the National League West. That meant the division title belonged to the Reds. It was still raining back at Riverfront, but nothing could put a damper on this celebration. We were watching the Toronto-Boston game on TV and uh, uh, we heard Marty and Joe come across uh, the air and everybody kind of went crazy. You know, we just high-fived it and uh, congratulated everybody. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a long time here and I think everybody's uh, you know, on top of the world right now. Actually, we couldn't tell because Hatcher had the flipper and he was flipping through channels, watching football games and everything that was going on. Oh yeah, I wanted to watch some football today and so uh, they were a little bit uptight, but you know, people, we were gonna know, somebody was gonna run in there and tell us anyway, and so it happened well for us. And we finally caught the tail end of a story that said it was a final in San Francisco 4-3 and uh, everybody started jumping up on each other on the tables and dancing in the clubhouse, it was, it was great. The game was finally called with the Reds losing, but for a team that held first place for a league record 162 games, this division title was well deserved. It's a great feeling, it really is. It's a, it's a combination of a lot of hard work on the players' part, on the staff's part, and here we are now uh, as the champions of this uh, league. It's, only, it's never been done before and it, it's a great feeling. The celebration was sweet, but a week later it was time to get down to postseason business and face the Pittsburgh Pirates, the gritty champions of the East who were heavily favored against the Reds. Cincinnati got some bad news just before the playoffs when it was learned that Bill Doran would be out for the postseason. On to Riverfront for game one. Champion T-shirt! How about those reds? <laughs> Cincinnati Post and Choir, special playoff section. After 162 games, the pennant would come down to the best of seven. In the opening, the Reds jumped out in front when Hal Morris gave Cincinnati a 1-0 lead. The Reds added two more runs and after one inning, led 3-0. But Cincinnati couldn't hold the lead. The Pirates got one run, and then in the fifth, Sid Bream smashed a two-run homer to tie it and send Pittsburgh on to a 4-3 comeback win. In game two, the Reds knew they had to find a way to stop Pittsburgh's explosive offense. That job fell to Tom Browning, who was facing Cy Young Award winner Doug Drabeck. And he was facing a red-hot Paul O'Neill. O'Neill hits it to left field pretty well. Finds it back at the track. Up against the Reds lead. It's a double for O'Neill who's driven in both runs. O'Neill's double put the go-ahead run on the board, 
and his defense in the sixth inning kept the Pirates off of it. And Bonds cracks it high in the air to right, and Van Swyke will tag at second. There's the catch, and the runner moves on to third base, and... The Reds put the defense to rest and then brought on the Nasty Boys. Rob Dibble held Pittsburgh scoreless for one and a third innings and then gave way to Randy Myers. With the Reds clinging to a one-run lead in the ninth, it was indeed time to get nasty. 2-2, second base, Duncan, Cincinnati wins it. The series would now move down the Ohio River for the first playoff game in Pittsburgh since the Reds and Pirates squared off for the pennant in 1979. Pittsburgh fans may have been dressed to kill, but in the fifth inning, the Reds were about to do in the Pirates. With the score tied and two on, Zane Smith was in for a surprise from Mariano Duncan. Deep into left field, might leave the park. It is gone for a three-run homer. And it's 5-2 Cincinnati. Well, the Pirates were thinking double play. But the batter was thinking something else. Duncan drove in four runs, all told. And the Reds got three superb efforts from the Nasty Boys. Randy Myers came on last and struck out three straight for his second straight save as the Reds went up two games to one. Game four turned out to be another tense and tight affair. In the fifth, with the score tied, the Pirates had a chance to take the lead against Jose Rijo. The go-ahead run was on second, and up at the plate, Jose Lee. One, two out. Up the middle. They might have a play at the plate. On the throw by the center fielder, Hatcher. Out at the plate, and we're tied. A single by Lane, and again, that strong Cincinnati outfield defensively nails the man at the plate to win the inning. They're a very aggressive team. Any team that Jim Leland has anything to do with, they're going to be an aggressive team. It's just, you know, uh, they force a lot of teams into mistakes early in the year with the running game. And it's just, right now it's happening for us. You know, we're making good throws and everything is happening our way right now. In the seventh, Chris Sabo kept things going Cincinnati's way. Sabo smashed a two-run homer and the Reds went up four to two. The Pirates scored once in the bottom of the eighth, cutting the lead to 4-3. And then with one out, Bobby Bonilla scared the daylights out of Randy Myers. Well, the center field, way back at the track, Hatcher, he gets it! Bonilla is going to go for third with one out. I was in the right place at the right time. I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was over there helping the outfielder, backing him up, because he's an aggressive outfielder. And uh, he went out to the ball with everything he had. And, uh, you know, the ball came. Everything just happened so fast. He came to him, I picked it up and threw it. It was perhaps the critical play of the series. And it was Pittsburgh's last threat. The Nasty Boys were back. And this time, Rob Dibble was the closing act. With two out, a two-strike count. Try call, and the game is over. The Reds were one win away from a championship they weren't supposed to win. But the Pirates won game five and sent the series back to Cincinnati for a sixth game. In yet another close game, the score was tied 1-1 in the seventh when the Reds put two runners on. Then, in a surprise move, Playoff hero Paul O'Neill, batting 471, was pulled for the right-handed hitting Luis Quinones. Hatcher running. Base hit, Cincinnati leads. Hatcher to third. 
Quinona's hit silenced the second guessers and put the Reds on the verge. But in the ninth, with a runner on first, the Pirates came within inches of taking the lead. He is not going, and a fly ball into right field. Franks is back near the wall. And he has it for the second out. How close was that? Two out. Moments later, the upset that Cincinnati had been waiting for. The underdog Reds were now champions of the National League. Well, there's a lot of excitement. It's been a long time for me. Um, I told him I'm sick of being a bridesmaid, and now they keep saying you're a bride. I said, no, I'm not there yet. I'm just getting closer to the altar. The Reds may have been underdogs, but they didn't feel that way. Hi there. How are you? Enjoy your game, sir. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Now it was time to face the no-nonsense Oakland A's, who breezed into the series with a sweep of the Red Sox, including last year. That made it ten straight postseason wins. The Reds needed whatever edge they could find, and in game one at Riverfront, they found it in Jose Rijo. Pitching in his first World Series game, Rijo was fast and loose, and backed by his own personal cheering section. Let's go, Rijo! Rijo went at the A's with ease. He found his rhythm early, and left hitter after hitter in his wake. Rijo was doing his job, Cincinnati hitters had to do theirs. In the bottom of the first, Billy Hatcher walked, and then with two outs, Dave Stewart suddenly became a mere mortal, and Eric Davis a hero. Runner going, fly ball to deep, deep center field. Huggy back, it's going to go! Davis's home run brought down the house and set Cincinnati off on a hitting spree against a team they weren't supposed to beat even once. The only bashing in this game came from the Reds, who shut out the A's seven to nothing, and then brought on the Nasty Boys to finish him off. And McGee hits it to O'Neill. The Reds have won. Still in Cincinnati for Game Two, the pregame rituals featured a visit from the First Lady. As for the Reds' first order of business, it was figuring out how to beat 27-game winner Bob Welch. In the eighth inning, trailing by a run, the Reds had the best man for the job. Billy Hatcher leads off. He's trying to set a record here. Hatcher flies to right in field and can't sink up. Cannot. It's off his glove. Hatcher's going to end up in third with nobody out. Hatcher's seven straight hits set a World Series record. The next batter, Paul O'Neill, drew a walk to put runners at the corners. With one out, Tony La Russa called on left-hander Rick Honeycutt. Lou Pinella countered with the right-handed hitting Glenn Braggs, making his first series appearance. Braggs has a chance to tie the score. Honeycutt's thinking double play.
The score stayed 4-4. The game moved into extra innings. The Reds now had to face Dennis Eckersley, coming off four straight postseason performances without a run. With one out, Cincinnati got two straight hits, and with two on, the Reds were looking for a hero. And the batter is Joe Oliver. He made the last out in the eighth inning and left two on. That ball is fair! Cincinnati's ahead! Two games to none! The series moved to Oakland for game three, but the tide that was supposed to turn didn't. The Reds were still in command. Sabo hit one over the boards his first time, and he is five out of nine. He corks another to left field, sending Ricky Henderson back, but not far enough. Another home run for Sabo, and it is five to two. Sabo's two homers sparked the Reds to a romp. Before the A's knew what hit him, Cincinnati scored seven runs in the third. And incredibly enough, had a chance to go up three games to none. And that's the way this one ends, and Cincinnati leads it three games to none. The impossible was now one game away. The upstart, confident Reds were in the unbelievable position of sweeping the Oakland A's. But to do it, the Reds would have to beat Dave Stewart for the second time. They also found out they would have to lose the services of World Series hitting star Billy Hatcher, who was hit on the hand in the first inning. If that wasn't bad enough, in the bottom of the first, Eric Davis sustained a bruised kidney. And the Reds now lost a pair of bats that had produced 13 hits. But they were undaunted. For the second time in the series, Jose Rijo delivered a virtuoso performance. En route to World Series MVP, Rijo pitched two hit ball and retired the last 20 batters he faced. But after seven innings, the Reds trailed the A's one to nothing. It was time to get something going. This is a loaded, nobody out, and the batter is Glenn Braggs. Braggs hits a possible double play ball, and only one, and a run scores, and we're tied. It is a 1-1 game on the infield out of the fielder's choice by Braggs. The batter is going to be Hal Morris. First and third, one out. will put Cincinnati on top. The runner tags, they could never throw him out. The throw goes into second base, and it's 2-1 to one Cincinnati. The Reds had every reason to be brash. They outscored, outhit, and outpitched the A's. And now they had them right where they wanted them. And a short right foul ball. Bensinger wants it. Cincinnati, the champions of baseball for 1990, with an improbable sweep over Oakland. When we clinched our division, I knew that we were going to play very well in postseason play because we got the monkeys off our back. Remember, this club hadn't won in a while. And once you taste that winning feeling, that confidence really exudes. And once we beat the Pirates, I knew we'd be ready to play here against Oakland. It's my great pleasure to present this trophy to the Cincinnati Reds, to Marge Schott, to Lou Pinella, and to Bob Quinn, all of whom deserve great credit. This is a wonderful tribute to a splendid team.
On October 21st, the Reds came home to a throng of fans waiting for their heroes. It was the end of a great season that brought Cincinnati an improbable world championship. And as fans rejoiced in the streets of downtown Cincinnati, it seemed that dreams really do come true.